First of all, spoiler alert. Life of Pi by Jan Martel's The Classic Man vs. Nature Story. In the skeleton of the narrative, it is a story of a young man named Pai Patel lost at sea for 227 days with a 450-pound Bengal tiger named Richard Parker. Pai describes in thorough pragmatic detail how he is going to handle the destructive forces of the ocean, Richard Parker, and starvation. Yet as Pai's journey lengthens and his desperation increases, the battle lines shift from Pai versus Richard Parker in the world to Pai and Richard Parker versus the world. Pai's relationship to Richard Parker peaks here. I love you, the words burst out pure and unfettered, infinite. The feeling flooded my chest. Truly I do, I love you, Richard Parker. If I didn't have you now, I don't know what I would do. I don't think I would make it. No, I wouldn't. I would die of hopelessness. Don't give up, Richard Parker, don't give up. I'll get you to land, I promise, I promise. In a brief search of the internet, the common discussion is on the dual narrative found at the end of the novel, where the fantastic story you had just read for the last 200 some odd pages is challenged by a second, more realistic narrative. Animals you were introduced to turn out to be humans, accomplishments of Pi are revealed to be exaggerated, and it pretty much leaves you feeling gross, with the very last pages being devoted to discussing how one chooses which story to believe. For our discussion, I want to focus on the relationship between Pi Patel and Richard Parker. Under the assumption that the sad story is in fact the true story, but also understanding that the richness Richard Parker's character gives to Pi explains his struggle far better than the dry, yeastless factuality of the sober tale. So, here are the two stories quickly summarized. Pai Patel grew up in the former Indian-French colony Pondicherry as the son of a zookeeper. During a particularly tumultuous political period in India's history, Pai's family decided to close down the zoo and move to Canada, a feeling we all can now relate to. Pai's father sold most of the zoo's animals to the Americas, and used a Japanese cargo vessel called the Simsum to transport his family to their new life. During the voyage, the vessel sank and Pai ended up on a lifeboat with three animals, a hyena, an orangutan, and a zebra with a broken leg. The hyena killed the zebra and the orangutan only to be unceremoniously offed by a hidden fourth animal, the Bengal tiger, Richard Parker. The rest of the story contains what I described before, a fight for survival against and eventually with Richard Parker. After Pai finds land off the coast of Mexico, two Japanese businessmen interview him to investigate the sinking of the Simpsum, and the second story is then revealed. Pai describes himself on a boat with a cook, a sailor with a broken leg, and his mother. The cook kills and eats the sailor, eventually murders his mother, and Pai ends up killing the cook. So we have the cook as the hyena, the sailor as the zebra, his mother as the orangutan, and Pai himself as Richard Parker. Alright, so now that we have a summary of the story, let's explore Richard Parker's symbolism. First and foremost, I think Richard Parker's character stands in for Pi's will to live, with all of the ferocity and amoral residue that comes with it. Pi's first exposure to the savagery of the Bengal tiger came in his father's zoo. To teach Pi about the dangers of the animal world, he had his son view the feeding of a goat to the tiger Mahisha. The goat started to jump. It jumped to amazing heights. I had no idea a goat could jump so high, but the back of the cage was a high and smooth cement wall. With sudden ease, the trapdoor slid open. Silence fell again, except for the bleeding and the click-click of the goat's hooves against the floor. I don't know if I saw blood before turning into mother's arms or if I dobbed it off later, in my memory, with a big brush, but I heard it enough to scare the living vegetarian daylights out of me. This sets the stage for our understanding of the Bengal tiger. Fierce, deadly, and merciless. Not something to be trifled with, especially when hungry. We finally meet Richard Parker as Pi finds himself on the lifeboat. The ship sank. It made a sound like a monstrous metallic burp. Things bubbled at the surface and then vanished. Everything was screaming. The sea, the wind, my heart. From the lifeboat I saw something in the water. I cried, Richard Parker, is that you? It's so hard to see. Oh, that this rain would stop. Richard Parker? Richard Parker? Yes, it is you. Pi continues to encourage Richard Parker to swim to him, even going so far as to throw a life buoy to the struggling tiger. And then it finally dawns on him that he's inviting a large carnivore into his small vessel and tries to change his mind. Hold on tight. I'll pull you in. Don't let go. Pull with your eyes while I pull with my hands. In a few seconds you'll be aboard and we'll be together. Wait a second. Together? We'll be together? Have I gone mad? Pai does everything he can think of, pulling away the buoy, hitting him with an oar, but all to no avail. The Bengal tiger makes his way aboard. With taking Pai as Richard Parker, I see this as a desperate inner conflict. Pai is in a period of complete disbelief. He refuses to acknowledge that his family is probably dead, that he will be lost at sea, and that he'll probably die out here. 
Yet he knows in his non-rational mind that he will need a great amoral strength in order to make it out of this alive. And it is this conflict between his civilized self and the physical requirements of his situation that caused the change of heart we see. Pi falls asleep and when he wakes up finds no evidence of the tiger. He assumes that Richard Parker was probably pushed overboard by the hyena. The hyena dispatches the zebra and the orangutan, and it is then and only then that Richard Parker makes his way back on the scene. The murder of Pi's mother takes away any hope that the tiger is not necessary. Pi then finds himself trying to come up with ways of dealing with Richard Parker. He plots to kill him, throw him overboard, or starve him out. None of these options will ensure Pi's survival, so he settles on taming the tiger. Pi's fear of Richard Parker shifts to the faux dominance of the ringleader, then to noble affection, and eventually to dependency. Pi transforms from a boy with modern sensibilities and concerns to the blunt and unforgiving will to make it out alive. The most striking evidence for this symbolism is when Richard Parker leaves Pi. He didn't look at me. He ran a hundred yards or so along the shore before turning in. His gait was clumsy and uncoordinated. At the end of the jungle, he stopped. I was certain he would turn my way. He would look at me, he would flatten his ears, he would growl, in some way he would conclude our relationship. He did nothing of the sort. I was weeping because Richard Parker had left me so unceremoniously. What a terrible thing it is to botch a farewell. I wish I had said, Richard Parker, it's over. We have survived. Can you believe it? I owe you more gratitude than I can express. I couldn't have done it without you. I would like to say it formally. Richard Parker, thank you. With the acknowledgement that the danger is gone and civilization is at hand, Richard Parker must leave. Pi is back in the human community, and the indiscriminate and pragmatic nature of the Bengal tiger fades without the slightest hint of friendship. For when Pi became Richard Parker, it is with the sad acknowledgement that friendship neither fills stomachs nor quenches thirst. <laughs> Literary criticism and analysis can be presented as an exclusive club, where educated people try to make stats of what the authorial intent was, or how well they employed their prose in various literary devices. And ultimately, I don't think my analysis of Life of Pi is either true or false, but mostly fun. And that's what doing this stuff is. It's interesting and fun. Part of the joy of good fiction is that it expresses the themes of an often disheartening and boring real-world experience and a richness that we could not otherwise entertain. Say the dual narrative were swapped and we heard a brutal tale of murder, starvation, and loneliness in the dry, yeastless factuality that Pi describes it as. Would we have had a better idea of Pi in this way? Could we see the multidimensional aspects of Pi's will, its nobility and strength, as well as its barbarism? That is the value of fiction. It gives us mythological tools to shift our perspective and broaden our understanding. I've read some interpretations that Richard Parker is merely a coping tool for Pi, and I suppose this interpretation has some merit. I think it misses the point of Martel's book. The lesson is not how colorful insanity is, but the incredible power of our often unreasonable desire to live. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in a couple weeks.